this is going to be a little writing chit chat. We're going to follow up on our smash hit gothic chit chat with some gothic character tropes. So that's what this is. So last time we've talked about essential elements. Yep. And the plot structure. Yes. So now we're going to talk about characters. Common tropes or patterns. That's what trope is. Um, but okay, so writing chit chat. So character tropes. We came up with, what, five different ones? Yeah. Or five distinct ones. Let's give this some context. So the reason we decided to do characters specifically was because we were talking about gender roles. Yes. And I think that the character tropes we came up with very clearly reflect what we were saying about gender roles in gothic fiction. Yeah. I don't even rem- remember if we talked about gender roles in the actual... We did a little bit, but we were having a private conversation about gender roles, yes. which is what sparked this. Yeah, we were having a just a conversation about gender roles, as you do. And subverting them. And subverting them. But we'll get to them. And then eventually, it just naturally led into gothic fiction, and we were like, hey, we could talk about that. Mm. <laughs> But I, th- I think that the tropes we have do very, very clearly reflect what we were, were discussing. Yes. About which the gender roles. Yeah, and the, the thing we were, the specific conversation that led into this, we were talking about how gothic fiction, or and even just like of the time period, women had no power. And that was true, IRL. But especially in fiction, a woman with power was punished. And men always had power. So let's let's go through let's, our tropes and see how that that falls right in line. Yes. So the first one we the first one we came up with was the damsel in distress, or you know the, the virgin, the the young girl, the maiden. Different names for that one. Or uh, the victim of the story. Yes, victim also <laughs> can sometimes be the protagonist. And I think we did note there uh, often dies. Yes. Um, although as we were making this list. A lot, pretty much any character in a gothic uh, could die. Like, mm-hmm. although I, you know, obviously a damsel in distress or a maiden or whatever, young woman, more likely to die than I think anyone else. Because I feel like that, like, a, a young virginal maiden in distress, like, that's such a, what is allegory of the world I want? Like, um, very symbolic. Well, let's, let's to talk about some examples. So the first one that comes to mind when we talk about someone often dies is... The monk. Yeah, she was a major plot point, her death. Yes, Antonia is the one I was thinking of. So Antonia was the the victim of uh, the monk himself. Oh, right. I forgot that he killed somebody. Yeah, he kills the, the maiden at the, near the end of the story. So we have that, and um, in Mysteries of Udolfo, which we talked of at length in our last videos, um, is obviously Emily. It was also the protagonist of that story. Yeah, so she has the distinction of not dying. Yeah. She doesn't have much agency. <laughs> no. But she she did not die, which I guess puts her a step above many of the other damsel in distress, maiden, young woman types. No, she just kind of is just made to do whatever. Until, like, the very end when she finally does escape. But she still does it with, like, a bunch of guys. Well, yeah, and then that feeds back into the idea that women didn't have any of their own power in gothic literature. She was basically just being ferried about or, you know, pushed around by all the adults in her life, particularly the males. Mm-hmm. Who else was there? Matilda. From, from Toronto. Who uh, was the sister of the one who had the helmet fall on top of her. Yes. She also dies. Yeah, Matilda, not in such a spectacular way. No. She was not crushed by a helmet. Uh, uh, she was just stabbed to death. We we don't want to make light of murder. No, 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 no. We are making light of a helmet dropping from the sky. And the fact that it can make murder seem trifling. Matilda was stabbed. Yep. Very unfortunate. One mm-hmm. of the worst ways to go, probably. Isabella. Oh, um, in Frankenstein, Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. How could we forget Frankenstein? So, um, Victor's fiance, who may be his cousin or just a longtime childhood friend, depending on which edition you're reading, uh, gets killed by a monster. For Victor's character development. Yeah. Louisa May Alcott, who is known for Little Women, Little Women one wrote, of my favorite books, wrote a uh, piece of gothic fiction, which was not published until long after her passing. In this novel, the main, main protagonist is also a young woman. 
who spends the entire novel running away from a stalker. And guess what happens to her in the end? She dies. Yep. Yeah, so even though she was the main character, she still still died. When, well, we'll I guess we'll get to the, uh, the overlord, the male villain mm -hmm. in the end, but almost all of these deaths are because of the male characters. Yeah, the people with agency. Yeah, so in... A long fatal love chase, Rosamond, her, she's trying to escape from this man who's been stalking her all around Europe, and eventually he he's chasing them across, I want to say it's like across the channel or something. There's water involved, and he, he runs down her boat with his, not knowing that she's on it. She, she dies, and Matilda is murdered by, I want to say it was her father, who was Mom the Frick. villain of, who was the villain of the story. And Elizabeth's death is a result of Victor. Mia's death was because of the monk. Now, see, here's another interesting trend here. All these women are being murdered by men who think that they love them. You know, it's kind of funny because I feel like we've grown up in an age of crime dramas. So, you know, you, you really you learn a lot about serial killers from pop culture. And one of the key, like, pop culture psychology facts about serial killers is that like stalkers or whatever, they're, you know, a lot of it is born from quote unquote affection for the victim. And it's, it's funny that this pattern arises. And obviously, this is before crime dramas were a thing. This is before modern psychology was a thing. They so, were getting there, though. They were getting there. I mean, Poe had not written the first detective story when uh, The Monk was published. No. <laughs> no, they were, <laughs> but The Monk was what, 1600s? No, 1700s. So you had like Poe and, and Otranto was even earlier. Well, yeah, well, Poe what uh, Poe was what 1850s. 1850s, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just funny to me that that pattern comes out like even before modern psychology made it well known. It was still kind of like it's like the human condition almost. So that wasn't even something I had thought about before. It was just as I was sitting thinking about all these deaths in these books, like oh, all of these result deaths are the result of usually the male villain. Well, I mean, in Frankenstein, obviously, Victor created the monster, so it's his fault, but the monster is the villain. Yeah. Of the story. So the, the villain always causes, or at least in these examples, causing the death of the the pure, the innocent maiden, the yeah. virtuous young lady. The, the stand-in for good is killed by the stand-in for evil. Mm -hmm. That's really depressing. Yeah. I mean, even just saying the tropes are just like common themes, they're not perfectly applicable to everything anyway. Yeah. That's so true. it's just um you know, common common threads that they have. So no no story is gonna exactly fit into any Yeah. That's great. Right. Otherwise it'd be pretty boring. You'd just be reading the same story over and over. Oh <laughs> just change the names. Um out. and of course like all of these are just our our opinions anyway. That's true. So someone yeah. else may have a completely interpretation of these characters. Let's move on to our next <clears throat> character trope. Now that we've completely obliterated all the main female characters. Yes. Two out of our examples, only two of them survived. Yes. All the rest die by the end of the book. And they were killed by men. So we mentioned um, the next character, the evil, the villainous, antagonistic force with the power, a.k.a. the Byronic Overlord. Commonly known as. So we should talk about why he's the Byronic overlord. I'm assuming that word is derived from the word Baron. Oh, it's from Lord Byron specifically. Oh, I was off yes. on that. Should I should I explain why? Yes, please do. Because I just assumed it had something to do with barons and titles. <laughs> so Byronic hero is a romanticism trope. Gotcha. Room gothic being a form of romanticism makes sense. And it has directly to do with Lord Byron. Both of his, according to Wikipedia, both Byron's own persona as well as characters from his writing are considered to provide defining features to this character type. So I'm going to continue reading from Wikipedia. The Byronic character is a solitary figure resigned to suffering. Very gothic. Manifest the concept of the fallen angel as a violent temper, lonely, melancholic, good-looking, dark, brooding, cold, cynical, and in possession of a sinister secret. Edward Cullen. 
But you know who that exactly sounds like? <laughs> okay, so I have in my right hand the Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> Obviously, the Phantom. Yep, the cold, Phantom. Cold, solitary. Fallen angel. Brooding. Mm-hmm. And the side of his face that's not mangled. Good looking. Tragic. Yep. And in this hand, or in my left hand, I have Jane Eyre. And I guess Mr. Rochester is considered the quintessential Byronic hero. Though he's not, yeah, even on the back he calls him arrogant and brooding. <laughs> he's not, he's not the villain of the story. Phantom of the Opera, Phantom is the villain. He's very clearly yeah. the bad guy. Mr. Rochester is the love interest, but he definitely has a secret, which is an entire person yeah. locked in his attic. Yeah, a secret in the attic. <laughs> That's a trope for you. Oh, gosh. So uh, that's immediately what comes to mind. Adolfo, there's the... So in my memory of Mysteries of Adolfo, there's a guy that, like, marries her aunt, and they're, like, in yes. his villa. That's the Count. The Count. That's the castle of Adolfo is his... Right. His crumbling, isolated, solitary hotbed of villainy. Yes, he's the Byronic overlord in that book. I would say, yeah, so I guess you have different kinds of Byronic characters. Like, you have the hero character, and then you've got the evil character. Yeah. So Montoni is definitely the evil character. He he tries to control every aspect of their lives, and is just generally villainous. Nefarious. Yes. So, um, the Byronic hero. Yes. Dark, brooding, Batman. Batman. Except less heroic. Yeah. I mean, even in um, Jane Eyre, Mr. Rochester's the love interest, he's still not a good person. Mm -hmm. Like, I, it, it didn't particularly please me that Jane marries him. He didn't really do anything for her. <laughs> yeah, and he kept his old wife locked in an attic. Why would you marry somebody like that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like this trope isn't quite as interesting to talk about. Like, it's, you know... Men who are Edward Cullen. Sad, I guess. Yeah. It's Edward Cullen. So can't express themselves in a healthy way. Uh, we could talk about the the femme fatale. Well, let's talk about the femme fatale. That's my favorite. AKA the woman who has power, ergo is evil. Because yes. gender roles, cultural norms, society. Femme fatale. My personal favorite character. Should we dive into some examples? Yes, please. Um, Emily's aunt. Oh, and Adolfo? Mm -hmm. For most of the story, Emily sees her aunt as an antagonist. Her aunt drags her along to this castle and is generally mean. But by the end of it, you come to find out that her aunt has been standing up to Montoni this entire time and refusing to sign over possession of her estates. And leaves her entire inheritance to Emily. That, that is one badass lady. Mm -hmm. Now that is an aspirational person. Mm -hmm. It's just, unfortunately, she was rather miserable for most of the book. You know, I feel like, given that she was fighting those battles off page, as they say, she had a right to be kind of miserable. <laughs> she probably was not happy. No, yeah, no, they, uh, they made up as she was dying. Well, that's such a common thing, too, you know, it's like the deathbed revelation or confession or whatever. It's like clear the slate before you go off to St. Peter. What do you think of Mr. Rochester's first wife? Hmm. Now, she's construed as villainous because it's like she duped Rochester into marrying her. And then he found out that she was crazy. Yeah. I think she's supposed to be evil. However, I mean, we sympathize with her, so... Yeah. But I think that was not the intention. Yeah, like, that's the thing. I think at the time, she was supposed to be... I think the reader at the time period was supposed to view her as, oh, you shouldn't have done that. But she's, like, the, the seductress. Yeah. She hid her true self. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, she ruins their lives by setting the manor on fire. Yeah. And jumping from the roof. Yeah. And conveniently removing herself from the story. <laughs> it's true. Modern audiences, I think she's much more sympathetic. Modern audiences understand more about psychology. 
Okay, so I looked up. So Bertha, the first wife, <laughs> is, I was correct, she is from the Caribbean. She's Jamaican. Mm. And she is of Creole background. So basically, Charlotte Bronte has made her as far from respectable English society as she could possibly make her. Yep. So we would definitely not confuse her with the upright, proper English lady. That's some propaganda right there. So she has been about as othered as we can get. Yeah. Cool, Charlotte Bronte. Yeah. Cool. So that was a thing, and I guess that's how you make someone very unsympathetic to audiences in uh, 1847. But in uh, 21st century, very sympathetic character. Very yes. pitiful character. Yes. Character you think uh, needed a lot of help and should have been treated better. Yeah, well, and that's a good example of how, like, obviously gothic literature is a very important genre, and it's, you know, been the foundation for a lot of modern literature that we know, such as fantasy, horror, science fiction, whatever. Um, but if you want to bring it to the modern day, you've got to make some very critical changes. Mm-hmm. In particular, the treatment of mental health, people from outside of a, a white, upper-crust society, people of color, <laughs> um, indigenous people. So, uh, yeah. So, definitely appreciate gothic literature for what it is. But keep in mind, if you're trying to modernize it, you better modernize the working class politics, the race politics, poverty, like, all of it. You can use those to make a lot of very clear critiques of modern society. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, please, please don't lock mentally ill people up in the attic. No. Yeah. Please don't. Please, please do not do that. Um, but going back to the femme fatale, another one I thought of was Matilda and the monk. The witch. Ah, the witch. Yes. The AKA... The word that people used to use for powerful women I don't like um, said a man in charge somewhere. <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> the uh, the author of The Hammer of the Witches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I can pinpoint that man for you. <laughs> and one very specific man said that, and then a bunch of other men quoted him and used it <laughs> to yeah, persecute. Hold on. The author of the Malleus Maleficarum, whose name was... Aunt Scott. Andrew. No. You ready? Yep. Heinrich Kramer. I was really off. Yes, if you want to know specifically, uh, <laughs> women I don't like are witches. That is the man. Thanks, Heinrich. That is the specific man who said that in man. an entire book, which got hundreds of people killed. But yeah, no, Matilda, because she's she starts off disguised as a young man. Ooh. To get into the, the monastery. Oh, or man. The monkery. The monk factory. What did it call it? Monk, I think Abby's, a, Abby's are at nuns. I'm pretty sure monks are, are monasteries. monasteries. Oh, the monk right. factory. <laughs> she, just, she disguises herself as a young man to get into the monastery yes. so she can get close to Ambrosio, the monk of the title. Mm -hmm. And then she reveals herself to be a woman because she says she's in love with him and that's why she disguised herself. So then she uses that to manipulate him, and then she reveals herself to be a witch. Mm. And then she reveals herself to be in league with the devil. She's got a lot of reveals. Yes. <laughs> she's a multifaceted woman. Yeah, she, uh, she's she got layers. Which just are just progressively more evil. <laughs> yeah, you peel the onion, and at the center <laughs> is hellfire. <laughs> Basically. Um, yeah, so she is directly responsible for... Everything bad that happened to him. No, I won't say that. She steers him in the direction, but it still takes his choices to get there. Yeah. She's the temptation. She, she's she's an enabler. She enables him, but he still was thinking those thoughts. Yeah. Let's put the blame where the blame is due. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, the person who's doing the bad thing. So... She wouldn't have had that much power over him if he had been able to resist the temptation, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, the, uh, the the crux of that particular plot line. Yeah. Right? 
because one of the main themes in Gothic is about temptation and whether you can resist it or whether you fall to it. Yeah, the monk. And that's how you divide your virtuous characters from your evil characters. That is that is also, I think, a very classic description of a femme fatale. She dressed up as a man. She bamboozled all the men folk, which is a big mark against her for the time. Can't bamboozle the men folk. Hmm. Uh, and she was seducing. She was a witch. She she communed with Satan. She's an all rounder. Mm hmm. She uh, at, at the end of the, the day, Ambrosio's own decisions were what put him in the spot he was in. Mm hmm. So that's that's the lesson here. Yeah. Well, and I guess that kind of feeds into like the whole Eve thing, right? Like the woman was the cause of the downfall of Eden. Mm -hmm. But it still was up to Adam to decide it was. whether to take the fruit or not. Giving into temptation, especially in the monk, most of it is sexual temptation. Giving into those temptations leads to their downfall. Yeah. Is the crux of most of the plot points in the monk. Which, I mean, when you're writing about a monk, I mean, I guess it's gotta be. Well, yeah, because they take a vow of chastity or whatever. Yes. So he he broke his commitment to God. Uh, well, like like you said earlier, these these are tropes. They're not necessarily, A, going to appear in every story, but B, one character could be multiple of the tropes. Mm hmm To represent at different points different tropes. Mm-hmm. But either way, the, the point, what we were trying to get at was... Women often do not are are not people who hold the power in the story. No, and even in the case of the femme fatale, aside from Matilda being a literal witch, doing actual magic mm -hmm. with literal Satan, like Emily's aunt is not in control. No, I guess she's holding out against Montoni, but it's taking every bit of her willpower to do this. Yeah. So it's she. It's not that like she has control, but she's resisting the control yeah. of somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I guess the tragic hero was under the male tropes. Yes, the tragic. Well, and I guess the main difference between a tragic hero and any other kind of hero is a tragic hero dies, right? Well, yeah. Pull back up Frankenstein <laughs> by Mary Shelley, because our dear friend Victor Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. The hero of the story, I guess. Mm -hmm. I want to call him very heroic. He's our, our main protagonist. He creates life. He abandons it. Mm -hmm. It uh, goes looking for him. It kills some people. It makes some demands. Frankenstein refuses those demands for the better of the world and vows to destroy the monster. And at the end he dies. Well, you had to be punished for perverting life and death. Yeah. But, I mean, he also experiences the death of his his wife, his That's best true. friend. That's true. Like, tragedy. Tragedy at every turn. But it's because of his own actions. Mm hmm But I see that gives him agency in the story. That's true. His actions have caused his tragedy. Yeah, he's not, like, at the whims of another figure or fate or whatever. He is directly not, causing. Not like our friend Emily, who is just at the mercy of Montoni. And, like, everybody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even though they're both the heroes of the story. Yep. Two very different levels of control over their own lives. Mm -hmm. And their own story, even the plot. Mm-hmm. Um, though so I, looking at, see, Dracula is a little weird because it's in the form of letters and journals, so there's not yeah. really a singular point of view character. I guess the main male characters would be, like, Van Helsing and Jonathan. I think those are the only two that actually have, like, point of view entries. Mm -hmm. I think it's them and Mina are the, the point of view characters. I would say probably Dr. Seward would fit this one the best. Jonathan is not a very strong... Jonathan's a victim mm -hmm. and most of the story. 
He's Dracula's victim. He spends a lot of time locked up in Dracula's castle. He he just barely manages to escape. He doesn't do much. Not especially not in like the first half of the story. He's a little more active in the second half. And Lucy is a point of view character too, but Lucy would fit under Fallen Woman, which we haven't gotten to yet. But Dr. Seward, I think, is the one who like calls Van Helsing and he's He's the one who runs, like, the asylum. Mm -hmm. So he he's the connection, like, how Renfield is involved. I think he was also the one who was, in, who was engaged to Lucy, if I remember correctly. Oh, so that I makes think it was Dr. Seward who was supposed to marry Lucy. Avenging. So, yeah, that, that gives him tragedy. Yeah. Like, Van Helsing is a hero, but he's not tragic. Mm -hmm. Jonathan is a victim. Well, oh, really, tragic hero is just, I mean... I guess that's where we could go back to the, the your 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 main protagonist who falls to the temptation. Yeah, right? that's their tragedy. Uh, some sort of downfall. So I think out of all of them, Victor probably fits this the best. He did not admit his faults. He did not fix anything. He died. Mm hmm. It made things worse. Yes. All right. What else? Uh, religious figures. Oh, we didn't talk about the fallen woman. Oh, the fallen woman. I skipped one. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Lucy. Lucy from Dracula, because she becomes Dracula's victim and turns into a vampire, so they have to destroy her. Yes, she gave it. She fell to temptation. Yeah. So I guess she's also, well, I mean, the fallen woman. We didn't really write down whether it's of you know their own decisions or becoming a victim of other worldly forces. Move on to the religious figures. The monks, the nuns, the reading or otherwise. Yeah, they're either pinnacles of virtue or they're weak and useless. Evil incarnate. I'm trying to see, obviously, it's easy, the, you know, pinnacles of virtue and evil incarnate. Those are two very easy, like, oh, well, obviously, virtuous people serving God, they're true, they're righteous, and then you've got you know, the people who say they serve God but are only serving their own self-interest, like, that's true evil. That is, yes, that is absolutely But I'm trying to figure out where the useless one falls. Um, like, what does that so, symbolize? So, like, in Otranto, you have Jerome, mm -hmm. who was a religious figure, and he was, he wasn't a monk, because one of the characters turned out to be his kid, but he wasn't evil. He was a good person. He didn't really help anybody. <laughs> so you could say then, like, he was a good person, but... Like, he tried, but didn't quite, you know, cut it. But trying is the important part, I suppose. Yeah. So, I don't know, it's just, it was also something I was reading some at some other point about this genre where religious characters are often made out to be kind of, like, weak not particularly helpful to the characters. Gotcha. It's just, you know, a lot of it was just criticism of the church. Well, it makes sense for the time period, because it's not like you could come out and directly criticize the church. No. But you could have characters who said they served the church, but then were not good. Mm -hmm. That kind of literary, those literary devices have been used to criticize so many things. For so many centuries. I'm trying to think. Actually, not a lot of... I mean, obviously, like, the monk was about a monk. But the monk was... And I said this before. Started off... We started off thinking he was the pinnacle of virtue, but then he turned out not to be. So he was weak. He gave in to the temptation. Yep. Um, and then the nuns in that story were also punished. The nuns were just, were just nasty people yeah. the whole time. Oh, and Jane Eyre, and I mentioned her cousin was a missionary. Yeah. It wasn't like he wasn't virtuous, but he was just kind of like unyielding and he didn't really understand people. Mm -hmm. Like his 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 personality was kind of stiff, inflexible, yeah. So then you have another kind of like you're another religious character who's more of a roadblock yeah. than a help. Who thinks that they're doing good, but they're not helping. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a criticism of the church. Um, there wasn't anything like that in Frankenstein. There's nothing like that that I can think of in Adolfo. 
No, I don't remember reading about any religious figures in Adolfo. I mean, I think, you know, characters stand in for certain sins and virtues. Yeah. But that's that's just gothic. That's... Yeah. I mean, obviously we're not even, like, necessarily covering every single gothic story ever written. These are just the ones I happen to have. I think we should wrap it up here. Okay. We did touch on the gender roles. Yes, the gender roles, what sparked it all. Mm Mm-hmm. Because just like any good uh, 21st century pair of feminist friends, we often speak about gender roles and societal <laughs> norms. And I think it's good when you're writing something like this to know, it's like you have to know the rules before you can break the rules. Yes. So you understand the classic tropes and the, the classic roles and how characters interact it, and then you can subvert it. Yes. And make boys who cry. Boys who cry, boys, boys who swoon. Yes. The world needs more of it. Boys who feel faint at the sight of blood. Yes. But yeah, I think <laughs> we have discussed also making a video of how to subvert the gothic tropes or bring them into modern literature. So we should. I think that should be a separate episode. That should be then. a separate episode. And then there may be some shameless self plugging. <laughs> yes, there's a reason we talk about gothic books. And then we'd have to actually publish stuff. Rip. <laughs> um, so yeah, so those have been the, the character tropes that we, you know, were. I think these are like the main ones. On. The main ones. We yeah. talked about a lot of characters. We did, and again, obviously, these are just tropes, and they manifest in different ways. They can be multiple characters fall under different tropes at different times. And this is our interpretations. Yes, mostly Sam's, and then there's me in the background, you know, chattering, like the monkey I am. Um, yeah, so that's, I've been Emily S.W. She's been Sam. Mm-hmm. And now we're done. All right. Bye.